Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to our session tonight, um, where we're going to talk about where do unschooled children, where do they learn about history, geography, art, music, and physical education, and as well, health. Um, this is an area I definitely have struggled with in that I at times didn't feel like my kids were hitting on those points, but um, I have the benefit right now of hindsight and being that the five kids are now adults and that they really have not had any problems um, hit missing these subjects. So <laughs> thank you for joining us and we're going to chat about this. So my name is Judy Arnell. I am a certified brain and child development specialist and I also do education consulting. Um, and I've written a few books. I'm a non punitive parenting and education specialist, written a lot of books on raising kids without any punishment, um, handling your patience, and just tips from facilitating 23 years of parenting groups. Also, how to handle screen time. They've been translated into different languages, and the newest book is Unschooling to University, where I detail our children's progress as well as 25 of their friends or my friends children's progress to universities colleges technical schools from unschooling so what i want to do is kind of talk a little bit about um unschooling so <clears throat> i'm not going to talk about this i've talked <laughs> in other videos. Uh, we do have a nonprofit group called Unschooling Canada Association. Feel free to join us if you'd like. Um, we always welcome members. And my personal blog is unschoolingtouniversity.com where I talk a bit more about um, where my kids went and just issues that came up while they were there. Um, please feel free to join our Facebook group, Unschooling STEM because three of my five kids went into STEM careers from unschooling. So let's just quickly, 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 if you're new to unschooling, what is it? Let's define what it is. And basically unschooling is child-led learning. So the child chooses what to learn, when to learn, how to learn, if they're gonna learn, all those kinds of things. So Conventional childhood is children play from birth till age six. And after that, we take them off the play agenda and we say, okay, can't play anymore, got to head to school. And they're there for the rest of their childhood, almost two thirds of their childhood, where unschoolers continue to let their children play. And through play, they learn just as much as their school counterparts, but in a much more enjoyable way. At the end of schooling, around age 17 and up, um, unschoolers decide they may want a more formal structure to their learning and go back to school, or they may um, use textbooks, tutors, whatever, to get the credentials they need to go on to post-secondary. So that's pretty well what unschooling is. Um, and you can see around age 17 here is when they have that final push of self-control to do the things they need to do to get into the pathways of where they want to go. So many self-directed learning schools only control the pace. Um, children are allowed to put forward what assignments they're doing in what order, but they can't control anything else. Where true self-directed education, children can control pace, content, scope, sequence, resources, methodology, and assessment. It's all their choice. So unschooling is basically knowledge acquired on a need-to-know time frame as determined by the learner, not by anyone else. In, at home, it's called unschooling. In a free school, which is not receiving government funds, it's called self-directed education. How do you do it? Easy, you provide plenty of unstructured time, 
and just offer things that might catch a child's interest. So learners do not need 16 years of formal education, absolutely not. But learners of all ages need more play, which is self-directed. So I had four, I have five kids. Um, four of those were accepted to universities across Canada. Three of them went into STEM careers. Um, so far I have three graduates and one master's student. And I talk about our story in the book. Okay, um, we're not really going to spend time tonight on brain development and learning because there is another um, webinar on that one. So what I do want to talk about more is those subject areas. Um, okay, so let's talk about, now this is what unschooling is. It's doing the real thing. It is living life um, and examining interests however somebody wants to go at it. So let's talk about history. Um, so I had a real trouble with history. I, with five kids that were close in age, they were all um, within 10 years. So 10, nine, seven, four, and one. <laughs> with that very variable amount of ages, it was very difficult to sign up for all age classes or family classes or home education classes. Um, so we, we kind of looked at history in a hit and miss kind of way. But what my kids found interesting was where they learned it. So they really loved the horrible history books. Some of them did, some of them didn't. So they learned about histories that way. Some really love the computer games they played. They were about age seven, eight when Age of Empires came out and they learned all about knights and castles and, and um, Roman and Greek history through that game. Then we, we often had theme days where we would take a country like France, Italy, Germany, and we would wear um, symbols of their clothing. So, um, now that's called cultural appropriation, but <laughs> back then we, um, you know, would wear um, an Oktoberfest hat for Germany, things like that. We would definitely cook the food that was popular in the country. The adults would drink the wine, <laughs> the beer. We'd have music and we would um, look at buildings and get a whole bunch of books out of the library and just find out more about the political, economic, and social aspect of the countries. And it was a fun way to bring it really, really home. As the kids got older, we did a lot more traveling, super cheap traveling. We didn't do tours. We did independent traveling through Airbnbs and trains and booking our own um, everything <laughs> pretty well. And as the kids got older, like when they were about 13 and up, they would actually read the exhibits at museums. It was really great. Before that, they would just go and try something out and play and bounce off the walls and fight with their siblings. <laughs> so they didn't get a whole lot out of museums until they were older. Also, now that they're older, they read magazines. Um, McLean's is a magazine that's more based in Canadian political, social, economic, um, culture. Time magazine is all about the USA and The Economist does a lot more in Europe, South America, Australia, and Asia Pacific. And mostly we had a lot of discussions. We would, we would watch movies, we would discuss them after, we would read newspaper articles, discuss them after. So it was really helpful to, to have that discussion with our kids and they took in what they could at the time with what age they were. One thing I did do in our living room, this is our living room, I did a basic timeline and put it near the ceiling on the walls. So <laughs> you can't see this, but at the other corner of the room is the dinosaurs. So we started there and then we didn't do anything until the next thing 
So it's kind of bunched together and it goes all around the room. And the kids found this helpful to understand what happened where. So if we watched a movie or they played the video game Age of Empires, where did that take place? And it, I, I could give them a little timeline once they started to read. The other thing that this is helpful is having a big map or a globe. And then if they hear something happening in the world, um, they, you can show them where it's happening, where it's at right now and where we are. And as their siblings moved um, across country, across an ocean, we could point out where they moved to, where they were close to. And that's the way they kind of learned geography was just having a map and a globe was very handy for understanding what places were in the world and what was happening there. So you don't have to use textbooks and workbooks to teach those things. Um, these are the computer games we found helpful and the toys we found helpful and the board games we found helpful that um, were available in our house. They were resources, whether the kids used them or not, didn't matter. Um, they were there, they were usable, and um, just handy to, to grab. So for visual arts, we had a very well-stacked craft cupboard. This is our craft cupboard here. Um, these are all the things that were in our craft cupboard. And um, the whole thing, we just got a bookcase with shelves and we stick things in there. And we buy things at for sale and um, that way the kids they if they needed paint they knew where to go if they needed glue they knew where to go we had papers and construction paper and all kinds of things for them um, some things were used a lot like acrylic paints other things like oil paints weren't used much but it was handy you have to have the supplies for performing arts what we did was um, we had a costume bucket, so if kids wanted to put on a theater and they needed a prop, say, for example, they needed a witch's hat or they needed a bouquet to, and a veil for, for their um, wedding costume, those kinds of things, they could just pick them out of the costume bucket. We had a sewing center, so the kids had access to the sewing machine. They could um, make things they needed to make. We had a bunk bed theater. So <laughs> We took the bunk bed and put sheets around it and old, um, I always collect sheets and cushions because they're just so open-ended, wonderful toys. But that's what they did. They made theaters of their dolls and their um, stuffies and they would make the tickets and they would usher us in and sell refreshments and learn about a whole bunch of things, math, language arts and theater arts. We'd often do homeschool trips out to different plays and things. Um, we found it helpful to enroll our kids into Boy Scouts and Girl Guides, and they did a lot of skits and performing arts in, through those venues. And later, when they were older, we signed them up for youth Toastmaster um, sessions. So these are eight-week sessions that teach kids how to do speaking skills, gestures, how to act and deliver a very engaging talk. And then when they really wanted them, we signed them up for dance classes or performing arts classes, whatever they wanted. And we all got theater passes. So um, children's theater we went to, and then as they got older, we went to adult theaters with more adult themes. So they got to actually observe performing arts and also participate in them. This is um, my child at her graduation, and she was um, empowered to give a speech, but she had lots of practice from <laughs> performing arts. So here's some things for um, phys ed, some computer games, toys, board games, and for music, drama, and performing arts of things that we had around our house and whether the kids may have used them but may have not. A lot of these things we got at garage sales, so they were not expensive. And we're lucky enough to live in an area where we actually get funding. We get about 
$800 per child per year funding. So when you have five kids, that's $4,000 a year. You can stock your house with a lot of variety of things for them to do. Music. Oh, music was interesting. So <laughs> when my kids were eight, seven, and five, they showed interest in various instruments. One like the piano, one like the guitar, one like the violin. And once I noticed they were tinkering away in the piano, um, what do you do? You think, okay, I'm gonna sign them up for lessons, yay. So they thought this was a good idea too. So I signed them up for lessons and about two months in, they stopped playing and tinkering. They did not wanna go near the instruments because it became, it, it just became too much of a chore for them and a commitment that was not conducive to their age or their interest level. So after a few months, I thought, okay, this is a waste of time and money. So I said to the kids, okay, you're not gonna get music lessons. You have to ask me three times. I think I took advice from my friend, Linda. <laughs> And I did that. I said, you have to ask me three times and then you can have lessons again. And that didn't come for many years until they were 15, 16, and 18, or somewhere around there, the oldest three. And then they asked me, they begged me for lessons. So I did. I wrote the checks, I drove them, and they were in a relationship with their music teachers and they negotiated how much they practiced. I refused to nag them. So they did. They did everything and they got at least about a good two years of instruction. And then they wanted to quit for a while and just practice and practice and practice and, and do what they wanted to. So now I have um I have one child who's very proficient in piano and one child who never took any lessons at all and he's really good in piano he just practices every time we leave the house and then i have one child who's good in violin and another child who's very good in guitar but never kept it up guitarists and violinists just kind of let that slide but when they're ready to really really want lessons when they're asking for them that's when they really want to put the effort into learning and their musical education started early. We, we had, as you can see, we had, um, we let them play with spoons and musical things from the kitchen. Um, and rock band video games really spurred their interest in music. When Zelda Ocarina of Time came out, they made ocarinas, they would play the music, we got Sims tunes. They love that kind of stuff. We got the music players, and we also got passes to concerts that we went to. So they had a really good musical education, even if it wasn't formal teaching or language or formal, formal lessons. Languages was very interesting too. Um, my two oldest children um, took two years of French immersion in grades one and two before we pulled them out to homeschool. They lost it all. And like anything in education, if the brain isn't using it, it prunes it. So they lost all their French. When did it come again? It came again when they had a need, when they had a use for it, which is so unschooling. So when my son wanted to do a work term in Germany for his engineering degree, he learned German. He spent at least six months um, watching YouTube videos in German, Disney ones, so he knew the story, but he could follow along with the accent. He learned Duolingo. He um, did a lot of um, independent language learning that was just self-motivated. And we went to Germany. He went to Germany. He could speak at a, a doable level. He could converse with people in German. And he was very handy because when we went to visit him, he could read the instructions on the washing machine in our Airbnb. Very handy. And then my daughter didn't learn French until first year of university and she took French and, and really liked it. 
And then my son learned Japanese when he met a Japanese girlfriend and he went to Japan to live for a year and a half and he taught English in Japan and learned Japanese. My other daughter, she was very happy learning Latin and she was teaching my younger ones Latin. So you don't have to worry. Yes, the window between zero and age five is very open for learning languages, but it's not the only window. It's a little more harder later, but it's not undoable. It certainly can be done. So physical education was very easy. Um, some of my kids took a grade 10 phys ed class online and it was writing assignments, 50 hours of writing assignments on, oh, what are the rules of basketball? And um, what are 10 things that keep you in shape for football or rules of play for football? They were not interested in sports. I don't know how I raised four boys and they were not interested in sports, probably because their dad wasn't either. <laughs> so. Um, we didn't make them learn sports unless they wanted to play a sport. We enrolled them in karate and soccer, as many parents do, but they learned enough to play and enjoy it, but they didn't need to learn more. If they wanted to learn dance, we put them in dance lessons, and it serves a purpose at the time, but it's not something that they're going to take up in the future. We got a lot of equipment from garage sales and it was just available for them to use. If they wanted to rollerblade, we had rollerblades. Um, if they wanted to go skiing, we had skis. We would buy memberships to gyms and play places and that really kept them active, which was the real purpose during those years is keep them busy, keep them active in between their gaming <laughs> so that they would stay healthy. So, Students are borderless. They can learn from any course or resource anywhere in the world. And the future is going to be improving qualifications. So boundaries, regulation will be less important. Education will be much more widespread. And teachers and schools are no longer the gatekeepers of education. In unschooling, kids can learn anywhere. So in conclusion, can play replace school? Absolutely, it can. Children can learn everything they need through play. In, and um, if they get older and want to do a more formal education experience, they certainly can do that too. Okay, so this is it. Thank you for joining us. If you want to keep in touch more, um, visit our blog at unschoolingtouniversity.com. Um, be sure to come to our Facebook page, Unschooling to University. We have a great Facebook group now called Unschooling STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And you can purchase the books here and um, find me at professionalparenting.ca. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope this was helpful. It's kind of a, an insight into what we did for those subjects, which it sounds like we didn't do much, but we did a lot. We were busy. <laughs> we did a lot, but we did things that really we wanted to do and were fun and enjoyable. And that's the whole point of learning is if it's not fun and enjoyable, it's not going to stick. So you want it to stick. Make it fun. Good luck and thank you.